Okay. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for joining us this morning, this afternoon, this evening, wherever you are. Um, my name is Sharon Cooper and we I work with, uh, with IODP in the Education and Outreach. And we're here today to talk about um, Expedition 395E and what, what it's doing and why it's out there. Um, and let me show you quickly where the ship is right now. So it's approximately here. I think it's probably moved a little bit north since we took this screenshot, um, but it is steaming towards Iceland from its main operation area down here. So just to give you a sense of where the ship is right now. So I have with me um, three of the four co-chiefs that are working on this expedition. Uh, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourselves? Roz, you wanna go first? Hi, yeah, um, thanks Sharon. I'm Roz Coggan. I am at the University of Southampton in the UK and I'm co-chief scientific expedition 390, which will be happening next spring now. Great, thank you, Gail. Uh, yeah, Gail Christensen, I'm at the University of Texas at Austin. I do marine geophysics and I'll be the co-chief on 393. Great, thank you. And Jason? My name is Jason Sylvan. I'm a microbiologist in the Department of Oceanography, and I'll be the other co-chief scientist on Expedition 390 with Roz. Great, thank you. Um, so can you guys tell us, because one, can one of you go ahead and tell us what are the main goals of this current expedition that the ship is out on now and how that relates to what you're going to be doing um, in a few months? I think that's you, Roz. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so actually Expedition 395E, which is, has finished operations now and it's on its way to port, is the second of two engineering expeditions that we've been lucky enough to have um, over the last year during COVID restrictions um, that are the prequel to two science expeditions that will, will now happen next year. And so the expedition that's been out at the moment has been doing engineering work to, to get the holes ready for coring next year um, for deeper drilling in, into the ocean ocean crust. Um, and, and that is all part of a project that's called the South Atlantic Transect. So that's grown from a two expedition to a four expedition project. We're actually really lucky to have the extra time and that the ship's been able to do stuff despite scientists not being able to get to the boat. And that project is really looking at how ocean crust ages. So although the earth is, is four and a half billion years old, actually two thirds of the earth's surface is, is covered in oceans and the ocean crust is generally less than 200 million years old. So it's much, much younger and it's constantly being replaced as new crust forms as a result of um, volcanic activity along the middles of the oceans. And then the, the crust spreads away like a conveyor belt going across the ocean floor and eventually goes down a subduction zone and goes back into the, the interior of the planet. And what we're trying to do is drill a series of holes from young crust about 7 million years old out to 61 million years old and look at how those rocks change with time so that we can understand what's going back into the earth and how that changes the earth. But also because those rocks provide records of what's been happening in the oceans above, that the rocks are constantly interacting with the oceans. Water is flowing through the sediments and through the volcanic rocks and leaving a story behind the record of how the world has been changing over those 60 million years. And we want to try to understand that history. We also want to understand about things that are living in the crust, but I'll leave that for Jason to explain. <laughs> Great. So um, what is unique about this particular expedition? So how have, how has the um, program dealt with the, ch the challenges of COVID and what is that, what kind of impact is that having on the, on the um, science that's going to happen later? Um, well, I can answer that. So right now it's, the, it's very difficult to get people to the ship because um, the science parties are international and you can imagine the complexities of flying to a, a, a port from all over the world. Uh, so instead, what, what's happening is the ship is trying to do engineering work that will help prepare the way for future uh, science expeditions. So for us, uh, we're really fortunate to have this happen. So right now, the ship uh, has put in some of the uh, infrastructure that will really help us uh, uh, accomplish more science when we go out. So you'd say this is a silver lining for your expedition? It, it is because uh, a lot of the things that are unexpected are the, the things that are happening right now. So they, we, we've hopefully gotten a lot of them out of the way. And that <laughs> would have happened when we were out there with all the scientists. And, and as a result, so we've had extra time because we would have had to yeah. do all engineering as part of our science expeditions. So we, we go there with, with holes already in the seafloor and, and can really get to work straight away. It's fantastic. 
so have you been able, so how has that actually happened in real life? So are you on the phone all the time with the ship telling them what to do or how, how does that work? Uh, so while the exhibitions have been out about once a week, right? We meet, uh, so there's one other co-chief that I couldn't make it to this call. So uh, the four co-chiefs meet um, along with every expedition has uh, a staff scientist who's a scientist that really, really understands both the science itself and the uh, mechanical aspects of the drilling. And they kind of serve as an interface between the science team and the drilling team um, and help manage the expedition. So uh, the six of us, four co-chiefs and two staff scientists uh, have been meeting about once a week and usually on the phone with the people on the ship. And uh, they give us an update of where they're at uh, in the plan of execution for the um, expedition. And then if it's going well, we're like, great. <laughs> keep at it. Um, and when it's inevitably not going well, um, I shouldn't say not going well, but if, if problems arise, then we just decide kind of amongst us what the best path forward is. And if we have to skip something or just keep with the plan and we'll see what happens. And it's been really, really uh, kind of fun being able to work with the people on the ship and see the progress as it's happening. So is this like, much like everything over the last year, we've learned to do everything via Zoom. And yeah. so, so we can all be in different parts of the world and, and still be talking to a ship that's in the middle of the ocean. You can't imagine that happening 15 years ago. The, the technology wasn't there to, to work like this. The, 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 the computing technology wasn't there. I remember the first time I sailed that, you know, once a week you, you made a phone call from the cupboard with a satellite phone and that, that was it. There was email was uploaded to the ship four times a day, but there was no photo. You couldn't even send a photograph via email at that point. So there's no way you could have done this then. We're very lucky that this has happened at a time where it's actually possible to work like this. So you're like a remote co-chief or remote co-chief team. <laughs> and actually the first of the expedition, so not the one that's at sea now, but the first one, the, the um, star scientist was actually on the boat as well. So so she was able to, um, to really sort of keep us well updated about what was happening over email as well and, and what was happening with the technical people, with the cores that were coming up. Because we have had some cores come up as well as part of this engineering work. It's been very exciting to see photographs of cores. Yeah. We're still excited to do. We, ha we haven't seen the real rocks yet. Either. Some of those cores came up um, in the winter last year and, and they're still on the boat. So we're really excited to see them in real life eventually. So that's a, that's a good lead in. What, what else are you excited about when you actually get on the ship? About What are you excited about doing? Uh, well, uh, the four of us have been communicating a lot, but uh, we have a much larger team. And uh, I'm really excited to, to meet all the other scientists and interact with them. I'm excited to, to meet the other scientists, to actually be on the boat, because whilst it's been fantastic that we have been able to work like this, nothing beats being at sea and sort of being immersed in that science for, for two months with a group of people who are all really focused on, on recovering those rocks and investigating those rocks and understanding what's happening. And so being immersed in that for two months um, and, and actually being part of it. That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, I, I agree. It'd be nice actually seeing samples. I, I think on this uh, particular expedition, you asked earlier, like one of the, what's unique about it? And I know that's unique, but it's it's a very concerted effort to sample um, through the sediments and into the rocks below that. And so getting to see kind of the scientists that have their different interests and different parts of that whole system that we're sampling is gonna be really fun. We all three of us have very different backgrounds and interests, and it's it's a really very multidisciplinary project. Some of those interests overlap, and some of those interests are things where we can use the same rocks to investigate completely different scientific questions. And so, learning about other people's expertise and what what they're going to answer from rocks, I'm planning to answer something completely different. You know, what else can they learn from those rocks that I I haven't even thought about? That's what I'm excited about. Yeah, that's what I think is always really interesting about our expeditions is how interdisciplinary they are and how many different kinds of expertise come together. Can you each tell us a little bit about your expertise and the kind of questions that you're trying to answer? Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll start. So I uh, am a marine geophysicist and I'm really interested in how the ocean crust evolves. So it's emplaced at the mid-ocean ridge and then as it moves away, uh, uh, hydrothermal circulation happens, and as part of that, uh, materials actually precipitate into the, the rocks, and that causes changes in physical properties. So I can measure those physical properties, 
but I want to actually see the rocks and see what's causing those physical property changes. And that will tell us about the processes that are happening. And so my, my research really overlaps with that because my research is specifically about how those hydrothermal changes happen. And hydrothermal just means hot water. So seawater goes through the cracks in the rock, but the rocks are still hot and they heat the water up and they react and minerals form as Gail said. And that changes the physical properties of the rocks and, and affects how they behave when they get to a subduction zone and might cause an earthquake. But it also changes the chemistry of the rocks. It changes the chemistry of the oceans. So I'm interested in how the rocks age in chemically how that affects um, cycling of carbon and all sorts of other elements through the earth system and how the crust is also recording how those things are changing. So can we can we extract climate records from ocean crust and, and understand how, how the earth, how and why the earth has changed with time? So in, my work, I guess, builds on top of both of those because I'm interested in the life that's in the rocks. And so it's really uh, important to understand the rocks themselves to be able to understand how that influences, I guess, both sides of how that influences the types of microorganisms, uh, so single-celled organisms like bacteria um, that are living in these rocks uh, brought there by the water moving through the system that Roz mentioned earlier, um, but also in turn how potentially some of their uh, activities might also influence the rocks themselves, um, and in particular if this is different in the younger rocks versus the older rocks that will be sampled. I think it's really fascinating how all these things go together because yeah. one of the things that surprised me the first time I worked on these volcanic rocks was that, that there could be life in these rocks. So these are rocks that are sitting, they're, they're tens of million years old, they're sitting under hundred meters, hundreds of meters of sediment, they've got warm water coming through, but they're nowhere near sunlight, there's no there's no photosynthesis to provide a, provide a food chain here, and yet there are things, things living in the rocks. So first I learned that there's things living in the rocks. And then I learned that the process that I'm interested in, how these rocks get chemi chemically changed, might actually be because of things living in the rocks. So they're not just living there, they are actually responsible for some of this process. So all this interdisciplinary stuff, it all just comes together and it's just fantastic to learn all this extra stuff. Yeah, I think it makes it a lot more fun because you get to work with other people and like learn a lot more about, uh, I guess, the science that you're doing through the, the knowledge of other people that you wouldn't be able to do just on your own. I think it's kind of mind blowing that um, I think a lot of people don't realize that there's actually life in those rocks beneath the seafloor. So we're not talking about just on the seafloor, but underneath right. the seafloor. And um, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, but there, the, that life goes quite deep down there, right? It's not just right at the surface, right? <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's right. So the the deepest we've recovered things that we can uh, comfortably call alive from is about twenty four hundred meters below the seafloor, which is like maybe somewhere around two miles. Um, those weren't just rocks; there's some mud and some rocks. But um, I, I, you know that a lot of the work that's being done. So I should say, in the scheme of science, um, it's a fairly young field, and so that's why uh, a lot of people hear about it and they're like, wait. wait there's things living below the seafloor. Because, yeah, wow. um, you know, people have only been studying, the, especially the really deep stuff through the drilling program for maybe 20, 25, 30 years. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's uh, they're, they're living down there. And part, I'm sorry, part of what people are interested in nowadays is trying to figure out what are the limits to essentially how deep they can live. So, you know, one obvious thing is if it's too hot, there's not going to be things alive. And with working with people like Yale, actually, we could try to figure out how deep um, you can go before it gets too hot, which we would say is somewhere around 120 degrees Celsius. Um, but there could be other reasons, like there's not enough food um, or the conditions are too harsh in ways other than temperature or food. And so that's one of the things people like myself are interested in nowadays. And then one of the things that's interesting is working out the role of those 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 processes in the past. You know, was it the same mm. in the past? Were, is this where is this where life started? Is this where life went? When does when does life stop? So I thought really interesting. And then isn't this uh, information kind of used um, in the field of astrobiology as well, in terms of looking for life on other planets? Uh, it it is because uh, it you know at the moment most of what we're looking for is life on our planet, but we know what some other planets look like, and so in places where we can say, well, this particular subsea floor environment or in other places on Earth um, looks like what we imagine this other planet looks like. You can 
start to qu ask questions about, okay, if this looks like that planet, what kind of life do we see here so that we can at least use that as a starting point for what kind of life we might find on another planet? Yeah, it's also a potential opportunity to, to look at technologies for for sampling these extreme yeah. environments. So one of the things that Jason has to really worry about that, that doesn't affect us in the same way is contamination of samples. How does he know that these really, really low levels of life in, in the core have come from below the seafloor and haven't been added in the laboratory afterwards or as the core was coming up through five kilometers of water? And all those sampling things will come into play when you're trying to sample um, in space. You know, you don't want to be right. sampling something in space thinking you've discovered life and then finding it was contamination. So. You don't, want, you don't want to find like your own DNA in there, right? <laughs> you would hope not. <laughs> uh, so I want to ask you guys a, a little bit about your own backgrounds, but let me um, show. So we actually um, have the ship. Um, we couldn't get them in, into this live stream because of the bandwidth, but we recorded a little video of our operations superintendent on the ship yesterday. So let me see if I can show that. Here, so you just get a sense of what's what it looks like out there. The anticipation is killing us, Sharon. <laughs> I am. <know. laughs> it's like when we're having a meeting with the ship over Zoom and the Zoom comes out just at the critical moment and we don't know whether they made the whole clock. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> Uh, I left there and then and then came back later and I'm a full time uh, operation engineer with the program now. So I, I basically been with the program off and on again now for uh you know thirty years. Oh, so what what's your favorite thing about it? Uh things are different places. Uh although we didn't get to see much of it down except for the inside of our quarantine hotel this trip. That's great. Can you show up what else is around you on the drill floor there? I'm standing just in front of the drill floor. Standing up a little bit. And can you tell us where you are in the ocean right now? In the middle of nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think they're by the, the Azores right now. Yeah, on holiday in the Azores. Yeah, exactly. It makes me want to be on the boat. Can you teleport us, Sharon? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, Zoom is the best we can do right now. <laughs> so I'm I don't just, know if you can. As long as all, all scientists don't always end up on shore now, I want to go back on the boat as soon as mm -hmm. possible. <laughs> yeah. I know, I know. I definitely do too. Um, so I don't know. I know that the um, audio on that, on that film is a little bit hard to hear, but um, Bill was saying he has a mechanical engineering background. And he's been working for the program for almost 30 years. Um, so let's see, can um, can you guys tell us a little bit more about your background and how you got to be doing what you're doing today? Uh, Roz, do you want to go ahead and start? Uh, sure. So um, I am a geologist. I, I did a natural sciences degree, but I, I focus on geology. And I, and I came to do a, a PhD in, in marine geology. And I was supposed to be working on ocean crust. So that that is the, the volcanic floor of the oceans. Um, but using samples that actually are on land where bits of ocean crust have been scraped off 
and put on land um, called Ophiites. And, and so I actually went to um, an uplifted bit of ocean crust that's in the middle of the Southern Ocean called Macquarie Island. And my research was supposed to be all on land. But during the first year of my PhD, I got an opportunity to sail on an expedition that was beginning to drill a really deep hole, trying to drill all the way through the upper layers of the ocean crust. Um, and I was able to go because my PhD supervisor was one of the co-chiefs of that expedition. And as soon as I was on the ship, I was just fascinated by, by not just the science, but the engineering, how you actually go about getting samples from the bottom of the seafloor. And by the end of my PhD, I'd actually sailed three times. Um, and, and sort of my career has taken a, a change from being based on shore-based samples to using samples from the seafloor. And I carried on and, and did postdocs, and I'm now a research fellow. Um, but this is a project that we started Oh, it was my daughter's second birthday. I missed her birthday party to go to Texas for the planning meeting. So she's she's nearly 10. It was her second birthday. So eight years ago, we, this, this idea was born for this project. And so for the last, last eight years, my research has really been focused towards getting getting these samples from the South Atlantic. So this is, this is my career now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Gail, do you want to go ahead? Uh, yeah. So I got my degree in geophysics from Texas A&M. And uh, then my PhD from the joint program, uh, MIT Woods Hole Oceanographic. And uh, during my PhD, I worked on uh, the, the seismic structure of ocean crust. And uh, I've, I've worked on seismic structure in a lot of different environments. Uh, most uh, famously, I guess, the, the Chicxulub impact crater. Um, but uh, I'm not just interested in the seismic structure. I want to actually know what the rocks are that uh, is giving giving that response. So uh, we call that ground truth. So I really want to ground truth the data that, that I get, which covers a much larger region with what you can do with drilling, which is you know getting the actual rocks, but uh, over just a, a limited area. So, so the two of those together is, is what I'm interested in. And for the folks out there who don't know what Chicxulub impact crater means, what, what is that? Uh, yeah, so that's the uh, impact crater uh, that's associated with the uh, impact that wiped out the dinosaurs, so 65 million years ago. Great. But no uh, dinosaurs in the cores. Asteroid impact, yeah. Um, yeah, Jason. Yeah, so I, um, let's see, I grew up on Long Island, which I don't know if it's technically an island, but it's near the water. Um, <laughs> so I've been interested in the oceans kind of since I was a kid um, and also interested in biology. So I used to think I wanted to be a marine biologist and I went to college uh, and got a BS in biology, but also a minor in music because I have a lot of different interests, I guess. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not very well focused. Uh, and I uh, started my graduate work here at Texas A&M um, studying uh, kind of what happens when there's too many nutrients running off from land into the oceans and causing these things called uh, dead zones, um, which is not at all related to what I'm doing now. Uh, and my advisor moved from Texas A&M to Rutgers. So I actually got my master's and PhD from Rutgers University, which is in New Jersey, um, and uh, ended up doing what I'm doing now because I kept applying for jobs until I got one. And the one that I got had to do with microbiology kind of at and below the seafloor. And I'm glad that that's the job that I got because um, I really fell in love with it. Um, and so I uh, worked in Los Angeles for a little while and then uh, moved to Texas a little while ago, about six years ago. I've been, been in Texas for six years now. So what are you doing with music now? Uh, actually, I play in what I usually refer to as my old person cover band, um, <laughs> which is all professors that don't have any musical career ambitions. So we <laughs> can kind of play and have fun and not stress about when I was in grad school. I should say, when I was in grad school, I was in uh, a few bands that played out a lot. And I feel like that's how I made it through grad school because you have to have something <laughs> to de stress about. But um, nowadays, I more about fun. You, less what, what do you play and are you bringing your instrument on the ship? I've been on a uh, ship with a piper before, so. So uh, <laughs> I play I play drums and guitar. Um, and my understanding is that my very own Dean, Debbie Thomas, uh, left an electronic drum kit on the JR from her previous cruise because she's also a drummer. Um, so I will check to see if it's still out there <laughs> um, and possibly also bring a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> we'll it's kind of important. The kind of 
you know, worth saying that when you're on the ship, you're there for two months. You're, yes. you're living there. And that's the way it is. And I've spent two Christmases on the ship, two Thanksgivings, which is not something I had celebrated before as, as a Brit, not not a um, mm. American. But you know, the, life goes on on the ship as well. We work every day, twelve hour shifts, seven days a week for two months. But we also have to get we have to have life too. So you know, there's a choir on the ship for Christmas, or there are bands on the ship. That's that's all going on. Too. There's a gym. You, you live there and, and and you play there as well. Well, I, so here's a question because you mentioned Thanksgiving twice. I've been out twice, and they were also over Thanksgiving. Why do they always make the Hard Rock people go out over like New Year's and Thanksgiving? <laughs> it's a, it's a conspiracy, like, clearly. Like, I, I finished writing my PhD thesis on the ship on Christmas Day. I didn't get a day off, but I got it done. <laughs> <laughs> so I so I have a question for for all of you. Um, why do we drill? You know, why is it important? Why are we um, going through all these? all these hoops and take people out on Christmas and, and Thanksgiving <clears throat> and make our turn ourselves into pretzels to, to do expeditions during COVID and fly people from all over the world to do expeditions when it's not COVID and spend millions of dollars on it. Why is it important? Uh, maybe this would be a good time for us to show her PowerPoint. Oh, well, I can't. So I've got some slides about engineering and then I can talk a bit about the broader aspects of, of why we drill, if you like. So the slides I've got first are really about how we drill um, and specifically how we do the engineering. So I could share those if you like, um, Sharon. Yeah, we can start with that. So can you see, because I've lost you now that I... Mm -hmm. yep, yep. So I, I just wanted to really show the challenges of drilling. So we talk about the drill string and, and in his video, Mike said he was standing behind, in front of the drill string, but it's not really a string that you can unroll from the ship. It's sections of pipe that you have to screw together. And we're talking about trying to reach the seafloor to collect samples. And, and our deepest sites are in over five kilometers of water. So you need a, over five kilometers of pipe to get there and then to get into the seafloor. And so you screw the pipe together in sections and they have to, each pipe, piece of pipe has to be picked up off the back of the ship and then lowered through the middle of the ship where the moon pool where we, where we, um, where we drill through and then they're screwed together. You'll see in a minute. So each section is screwed on using the top drive. And then you can lower that section down and screw on another one. So eventually you build up a drill string that will reach all the way to seafloor. And in five kilometers of water, that takes 24 hours. And here you can see a re-entry cone on the seafloor and then the coring bit rotating. So that rotation is coming from the ship. The pipe is being rotated at the very top five kilometers away and drilling a hole. And what we've been doing for the last um, two months is installing the, the wrenchy cone that you saw. And actually, as Mike said, because we we don't want the sediment that's sitting on top of the crust to fall in the hole, we've got a, a pipe hanging off the bottom of that cone that goes through the sediment pile. So our deepest one is over 500 meters. Um, and those cones get lowered through the middle of the boat. So this is the drill string down the middle, going down through the moon pool. It's called the moon pool because the way it glows. And we assemble a big cone, it's about two meters in diameter, metal cone that's lowered down on the bottom of the string. And that eventually sits on the seafloor with a tube of pipe sticking through the sediment. And then it, in, when we come back to the holes next year, we can lower a camera, this is a camera on a frame down the drill string to see that cone sitting on the seafloor five kilometers below us and maneuver the ship using its um, dynamic positioning system to, to get the drill pipe. You can see the pipe coming over the cone here so that it's in the middle and then lower it so that, so that you're um, putting the, the drill bit into the hole. And having this system on the seafloor is really important because we need to be able to re-enter the hole multiple times to change our drill bits because they wear out after a few days. So those were the, the pictures that I had of that. Um, so there's the pipe now going into the cone. And I also have some pictures of some of the rocks that, that um, have been recovered already. And I included this one because it shows the rocks in their plastic core liners being put on the core table. So we usually drill a 10 meter interval at a time. But I also showed it because it shows what the rocks are like. So here we can see some, some lavas and the white veins through them. Those are white mineral veins that have formed from these hydrothermal fluids that are coming from seawater. So hot fluids have precipitated those minerals. And you can see the change in color of the rock. It's even easier to see in this next picture. So you can see where the white veins are, but you can see the rock looks bleached along it, and that's where it's been affected by the fluid and changed. And so that's the sorts of samples that we're going to be taking to, um, to understand how, how the crust is aging. And I'm going to stop sharing there. And then I'm going to ask you what your question was, Sharon, because I don't think that really answered your question at all. You asked me about 
Um, what was the question? Well, it's kind of <coughs> kind of a general question about why we why drill. We drill. Yeah. So um, that shows you how we drill, and so the challenge of, of reaching samples below the sea floor. So why go through that trouble of reaching a sample five kilometers below a moving ship to to recover a sample that when when there's rocks all over land? Why wouldn't we go and pick up rocks or mud on land? Well, first of all, from from my research, we're trying to understand um, the ocean crust, which is completely different to continental crust. Like I said, it's, it's um, being remade all the time. Two thirds of the Earth's surface is being turned over and remade. But sitting above those that ocean crust, there is sediment that's accumulating, both from material that's washing off the continents, but also from um, biogenic material that's grow living in the oceans and falling down and, and accumulating layers over time. And those, oh, hang on, my children have come in from school. Hello, are you okay? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So those layers have accumulated over time and they they um, contain a time machine like record of how the earth has changed with time. So that's how we can build up records of past um, environment and climate. So we could look at ice cores, but the records don't go back nearly as far. We can go back um, tens of millions of years by looking at records from the seafloor. And in fact, ocean drilling, which has been um, celebrated its 50th anniversary in 1968, so scientific ocean drilling has been going on for over 50 years, has made a lot of enormous contributions to, to our understanding of how the Earth works. It was actually in the South Atlantic um, where we're drilling, the area we're drilling during its third expedition in 1968, that the rocks were recovered that proved the theory of plate tectonics. And without these samples from the seafloor, we wouldn't have been able to prove um, prove that. We've had, um, as Gail mentioned, it's a way we can sample things like impact craters and understand the events that were associated with the extinction of dinosaurs. We can get climate records. We can basically get rocks that we can't get any other way. If we could just walk and get the same rock on land and get the same signal, then of course we would. And there are complementary records from our land that we look at and we work closely with other programs that, that sample those. But these are really unique records that preserve the history of the planet and, and can let us answer all sorts of questions that we wouldn't be able to answer without them. And there isn't any other way to sample deep below the seafloor. You can sample on the seafloor with a submersible um, or with, with a robotic um, sampling, but you can't sample from two kilometers below the seafloor without drilling a hole. There's just no other way to do it. Does anyone want to add anything to that? That's really great. I'm sure my daughters would like to add something if they come back. <laughs> What are you missing our birthdays? <laughs> <laughs> I did leave a cake. I made I made a uh, um, a tractor cake for her birthday because that's what she wanted. A Bob She's very cake. young. She doesn't remember. <laughs> <laughs> She'll remember now, Jason. She's just <laughs> it's, it's always good for guilting mom. <laughs> that's true. You should you should have kept it quiet. <laughs> So what happens next? So this um, this expedition will uh, wrap up in in Iceland in uh, a week or so. Um, and so what what will happen next before your expeditions begin? Well, I think the first thing to say is that we've been enormously successful. So in our expeditions, we plan to drill six holes, and we have now got five of those holes established on the sea floor. So we're we're good to go for for coring. Over, over the next year, well, less than a year now, I guess the, the, the global situation is gonna be evolving and we'll be keeping an eye on that and seeing who's still able to come to the boat and, and, and putting together our, our um, plans for, for getting to the boat. But we're really lucky because we've also got some initial samples. So there is some, some initial um, research going on to help us understand um, ages of sediments that we've recovered and, and put us in an even better place to be better informed when we actually go to sea and collect more samples to help us guide our sampling. So we're really lucky in that regard that we have got some material already. So will you be able to take a close look at the samples that that were collected on this on this leg? I, I don't think that we, um, that we will see most of the cores. What we've actually been doing is taking a small amount of sediment from the from on the bottom of each of the cores where we've called in the sediment, and um, and that is being sent to members of our science party who who work on dating sediments um, to look at um, the the um, bi biogenic records. They're looking at things like the forearms, and they use those to get a dating record so that we can work out the sedimentation rate and the ages of different levels of the sediment. But they just have a very small part of the sample that has been sent to them. The rest of the cores are being kept, I believe, on the ship. Um, and we will describe those fully when we're on the ship for our expedition. So we will incorporate those cores into our expeditions and look at them then. 
And when's the when is the first um, when does the first expedition go out? April seventh, next year. Okay, yeah. So it's less than a year yeah, apart. We yeah. we hope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now so. our expeditions are actually back to back, I believe. So so yeah. Jason and I will be out for two months and then we'll um, cross over with Gail and Damon in whichever port it ends up being in. I I've, lo I've lost track of where we're going. Yeah, um, they keep moving it around based on the current global situation. Yeah, so it'll either be South Africa or South America. Um, <laughs> That's all. I don't think we'll be doing, so to the, to the moment, one, so we've had two expeditions, but they've actually, those two month expeditions have done three to four weeks of engineering work, but they've actually had to, to transit the whole, whole ocean because the place where they've been able to get people on and off the ship um, have mostly been uh, in Europe, or that they did have ports in South Africa as well. So they've started in South Africa, but they're going all the way up to Reykjavik now in Iceland. So they've spent um, five weeks sailing long distances across the ocean as well. So you can you can spend a long time on the boat if you if you need to go a long way. <laughs> yeah, it's a nice office view, like Bill was showing us. Nice little cruise. <laughs> and so we have. Um, on each of these expeditions, there are what about 25, 30 scientists from all over the world, right? Yeah, that's one of the really great things, getting to meet people from all over. And, and it's nice, it's not, uh, it, it, the people range from uh, graduate students all the way up to senior scientists. So uh, a diverse group of uh, international and uh, career stages. Yeah. And because it's a, a joint project, the two expedition parties are actually part of one science team as well. So. Where, where normal drilling expeditions have maybe 25, we've, we've got a team of 50, so even more people to meet, which is great. And as we, as we will actually be back to back, we will actually all meet, it, if that's allowed, <laughs> in port somewhere. <laughs> At least wave to each other. <laughs> so I imagine that um, most of those scientists are all kind of watching eagerly to see what, what this expedition is finding out, right? Yeah, I think one of, one of our, ta you asked what we're doing over the next year, one of our tasks is keeping them interested. Um, and so we, uh, after, right after the last, the first cruise, 390C, um, first engineering cruise, we had a uh, kind of virtual meeting to talk about what was done and kind of keep people's interest. Because originally we were supposed to go out, I don't even remember at this point. No. <laughs> when it was, but it was a while. It's a while ago. Before. <laughs> yeah, in the in the fall, I think. Right. So people and and uh, the people that have been uh, selected to sail on these expeditions that that's all been done like a year or a year and a half ago. It's it's been a while. So kind of trying to keep people interested that are in, involved in kind of the more frequent um, interactions with the ship is, I, I think, part of what we need to do. Yeah. Yeah, we do have another expedition that's that's going out uh, in June using the same yeah. model, um, and in that case, all the scientists are they've all they have a they've created a Slack channel and they're like you know they're they're signed up to do something whatever they can do from shore you know while communicating with the ship and trying to stay engaged and and all that while the the tech crew on the ship is collecting the samples so. It's not ideal, but it is a way to, to keep the science going. So that's yeah, yeah. And it's, my understanding is it's better to keep the ship doing stuff than just sitting in a dock. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean we have to pay for the ship. Uh, taxpayers have to pay for the mm -hmm. ship uh, regardless. So it's better to have it doing something useful and and interesting <laughs> and worthwhile. It's always better for machinery to be operated as that's well right. when it when it gets um, turned off for a while. Turning it back on again can be difficult. So. Great, yes. that it's, great that it's operation. Yeah, and I was going to say, it, this has been great for us because, I mean, th this is really challenging drilling because of the water depths. And, you know, one of the things that we found, oh, well, they found when they're out there was that there are some problems with the camera at those those depths. And then they fixed it. So, um, so, so you know, that's something that could have happened when we were out there uh, during our expedition. But now it's already been, happened. It's been fixed. And... Uh, you know, hope, hopefully we won't have that kind of problem. So you, so you will actually have extra days for science, right? Yes. Yes. Kind One of. thing is that the way the science program works is that um, scientists, a group of scientists will propose an expedition and, and if they're successful, they'll get scheduled for, for normally one expedition for two months, but sometimes projects that require longer like ours, because it had engineering, will get two. 
and and what you achieve in those two months that's it that's what you've got so if things go wrong and, and you didn't get done the, the ship doesn't stay there and keep going and go for longer it, it has to move on to the next project and so we've been really lucky not only have we effectively had extra time because of these engineering expeditions which frees up time for science but we also had time to solve those problems with the camera and and that system rebuild that gail talked about that happened in between the two engineering expeditions not not on board so We've been really, really lucky, but yeah, normally whatever you manage to get done, you have to overcome those technical challenges that you face at sea, and 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 that's your two months. So, um, having a having a dry run or a wet run has been great. <laughs> right, right. I just put the um, website there at the bottom of the screen so that people, if they're interested in following along with um, these expeditions that we're talking about now, or the, the any of any of our expeditions. Um, at joinsresolution.org and all the, the Facebook page and Twitter and Instagram and all that associated with that. There are lots more videos as well showing how, how drilling is done. The, the one I showed, you can find lots more of those videos on the website. Okay, so we have a question coming in uh, from Facebook. Um, what is one piece of information you would like a non-scientist to know about the upcoming expeditions, 390 and 393? Oh, just one. What would yours be, Jason? <laughs> uh, I guess just kind of how incredibly interdisciplinary it is. So I mean, even just the three of us here uh, have various different interests, but it's um, if you add on all the scientists that are actually sailing, we have people who are interested in, you know, what the earth looked like in the past. We have people who are interested in microbiology. We have people interested in the actual structure of the earth. And so I think that uh, it's not, uh, it's not unheard of, but um, not as common to have mm -hmm. such uh, interdisciplinary uh, So it's going to be it's going to be exciting for many reasons. Maybe that's the thing I would say. <laughs> I think I would say sort of a general of ocean drilling is that by drilling in different places and getting samples from different places on our planet, we can build a picture of how our planet has changed in space and time. And so it's a, it, it is really a time machine for looking at how things have changed. And, and that's really what we're trying to do by drilling a series of holes in different places. So we're going, we're going um, in Doctor Who's TARDIS next week, uh, next year, except it will be a lot bigger. Oh, I don't, I don't know if we've mentioned this. So one of the things that I, I still like, think is awesome uh, is, so we, we've talked about that we're drilling a series of holes and um, the idea is to look at how the crust changes when it gets older. Um, but actually the sites where sampling were specifically selected because they were all made at the same place on the seafloor, more or less. Um, and so it's really exciting to me because we are literally going to be able to look at how it the crust changes and not have to worry about like you know things related to well this piece was made in a different piece than that piece and thinking about or different ocean different basin or yeah, yeah different spreading rate. No, it's exactly that. It's sort of a conveyor belt away from the ridge of of material produced in the same place, but a different snapshot in time. But actually, the thing I find really exciting about the area that we're going to is actually that we're following in the footsteps of explorers and, and that this was the area, you know, 50 years ago where they drilled a series of holes again across across um, across the seafloor and showed that the whole, the, the rocks at the bottom, the, the volcanic rocks got symmetrically older away from the middle of the ocean. And that's how they knew the oceans were spreading away from the middle of the ocean. And that's how they proved plate tectonics. And they didn't, they didn't know what they were, you know, whether they were going to even be able to drill those holes or get through the sediment or get those rocks. And um, I just find it so exciting to, to be following in the footsteps of explorers and adding to the story. Yeah, we really are explorers, aren't we? This is like a, the frontier of our planet. Um, I think, I think we have, we're explorers with a purpose. So we know what we're hoping to find out or what we're hoping to discover, but you never know what you're going to find out. You always find interesting things wherever, wherever you get samples from. And hopefully you answer the question you went with but there's always new exciting discoveries. I mean, 50 years ago, they did not know that there were, there were things living in the lava as they were looking for to, to, to prove the plate tectonics. That, that's a discovery that was made by ocean drilling, so. Right, and one of the things I've heard people say before is that um, you go out there with certain questions but and, and you hope that you'll find some answers, but also you end up generating lots more questions, right? Has that been your experience? Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> even with the, the, the work that's been done now, you know, so, so uh, one spot we thought that we'd encounter the volcanic rocks at what about 150 meters depth beneath the seafloor, and we found them at 50 meters. So we we don't know why, um, and so that's something we we need to actually look at 
look at the samples and, and figure out. So, so, so there's already something unusual that's going on. And we, and we weren't just guessing the depth. You know, we had done site <laughs> surveys to, and 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 measured where we thought they were, and and they still weren't where we expected them to be. So, um, yeah. Can you explain what a site survey is? I'll let Gal do that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so before it's quite expensive to send the drill ship out um, to to drill. So before um, we do that, we have what we call a site survey, so that we know the best place to locate our drill sites. Um, so that's what a site survey is. So, so you look at the substructure, you look at how things change in the region. You don't want to choose an unusual place. You want to choose something that's representative. But that's a remote survey where we're making measurements from the ship. We're not, you know, there's no drilling involved with that. I, I don't know the names of all the instruments that Gail uses, but um, Gail and, and Bobby Reese led, led the site survey for our expedition and they collected lots of different data to, to both find us the best places that would let us answer the question, but also safe places to drill, because you don't want to drill a hole somewhere where it's going to be dangerous either. So that's really important as well. And you use different ships for that, right? What, what ship were you on, Gail? Uh, so we used a ship called the Langseth. Okay. Uh, it's a US ship that uh, does academic seismic surveys. Um, that's the tool we used. I'm familiar with that one based out of, out of Lamont. <laughs> I mean, what, what's challenging about the area we're in is that um, uh, it's uh, the, the crust is formed at a slow spreading center. So a lot of drilling has been done at crust formed at a fast spreading center. So uh, there you have um, a lot of melt and magma. And so you're continuously forming ocean crust that's you know very similar. Whereas at slow spreading centers, it's more episodic. So sometimes you are forming magmatic crust. Sometimes it's thin, you know, you don't have as much. So the crust is thinner. Um, there's a lot of faulting and topography. So, so that makes it more challenging to find a, a good place to drill. So we're just kind of amazed that the 50 years ago when they drilled that they were able to, to get the samples they did because um, the, the, the surveys they had at the time were, were so different than what we can do now. Yeah, it's so interesting, right? When you look in the past, because I was thinking about that when I, at the, um, it was the 50th anniversary of the moon landing, uh, I guess it was 2019, right? And um, they had an exhibit here where they had the, the, the vehicle, the landing vehicle, they were, I think it was traveling around from the Smithsonian. Anyway, you look at that and that was 50 years ago and it, it looks like a tin can, you know, like it looks very um, not so, sturdy <laughs> whatever but yet it landed on the moon it did exactly what it was supposed to do and uh brought everybody back safely and um we did that 50 years ago too. <laughs> so it's, there's definitely an amount of bravery required to do to do those things for the first time and, and sort of try out the technology right and trust in the engineering yeah. and all the work that's gone into it before yeah yeah it's amazing it's amazing how many different kinds of people are involved in putting these expeditions together um all different kinds of job descriptions and roles you know you have the engineers and you have the scientists and you also have all the support people and the funders and you have the people who operate the boat and you have you know it just goes on and on there's just so many so it's it's really amazing to to see that all come together in the service of finding um you know finding out new information about our planet I think working with those other people that you know, are in different fields is one of the fascinating things. One of the things that I really enjoyed my first expedition was the real time engineering, the solving the problems as they happen to make sure that we got the samples that we wanted, inventing new devices on the ship, designing, you know, when you've accidentally put something on the seafloor and you've got to pick it up again, divide, divide, dividing the tool to fish it off the seafloor and bring it up through five kilometers of water or something's broken in the hole and you've got to get it out of the hole. The real time engineering is amazing. Yeah, the, the, uh, the creative problem solving, right? I've been on expeditions too, where I've seen that happen, you know, where something, they're deploying some kind of instrument, it didn't work, and they were working on it for 18 months before that, and something didn't work, but instead of, whatever, throwing a tantrum and, and going in a corner and cry, they try to figure out how to fix it, how to make it better, and try it right again then, yeah. just turn it around, fix it, figure it out with what they have on the ship, right? It, only what and, you got on the ship. You're too far away normally to have a helicopter bring you stuff. So you've got to use what you've got and you can't say, oh, well, we'll come back next year and do it because this is your two months now. So you've got to, you've got to solve the problem now or, or you're done. So, and they do, they, they, they solve the problems. 
Yep, with duct tape and uh, whatever else you need. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you've got there. <laughs> so that's great. Um, let's see, I don't see any other questions coming in. I'll put one more post here. See, we have an audience of thousands watching us. Gosh. I have one. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> Uh, WD-40, someone's recommending, yeah. <laughs> Isn't it duct tape or WD-40, one way or the other? Right, yeah. one of those things. <laughs> Whether need to get it apart or get it together. <laughs> right, right. So uh, while we're just waiting a minute to see if there's any more questions, is there anything else that you would like to share with? I guess the thing that I've really taken from I mean, it's slightly scary for me that we talk about the fact that ocean drilling is 50 years old and I like to think that I'm a young scientist, but actually I've been involved in ocean drilling for, for two decades now. So quite quite a bit of that 50 years. Um, but the one thing I've really appreciated over, over those, those 20 years has been the chance to go places that people haven't been. And I don't mean places on the surface of the earth. I mean, literally places by using a drill core to get from places that we haven't been before. So I was involved in an expedition that, that called through the upper crust, so through the lavas and the stuff that's coming out of magma chambers actually into rocks that were forming in a magma chamber below, that had formed in a magma chamber 15 million years ago below the sea floor. And to be able to put my finger on that boundary between the upper crust and the lower crust and know that people hadn't done that ever before from rocks that had come from below the sea floor had just come from below the sea floor. They could find the equivalent boundary maybe preserved on land after it had been through a complicated history. But we could do it from samples from the sea floor. And we were the first, it was like taking that first step for mankind. It was really exciting. Yeah, that is exciting. I hope you got a picture of that. <laughs> there may be a picture with a flag in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it is not an American flag. <laughs> <laughs> We're international here. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in right now, so I think we can um, wrap it up. And uh, I just want to thank all of you for being here today and um, talking about the the, exp the current expedition, the upcoming expedition, and, and why we're drilling, why we're doing it. So thank you for that. And um, we will return with with more discussions like this in the, in the months ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'll update you when we're having a real science expedition as well. That would be exciting. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, watch the Facebook page and Twitter, Instagram, all that for announcements about the upcoming expeditions. Um, as we mentioned, there is, an, there is another expedition starting uh, next week-ish. Um, and uh, so there'll be, there'll be a lot of media coming from that as well. Cool. Thank you, Sharon. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.